My name is Jules Pelt Feldman, and I'm postdoctoral fellow for the research project Performance Conservation Materiality Knowledge, which is located at the Bern Academy of Arts and sponsored by the Swiss National Science Foundation. And today I have the honor of interviewing Pip Lawrenson. Pip is Professor of Conservation at University College London and Director of its brand new Master of Science program in Conservation of Contemporary Art and Media, which is very exciting. Pip is an innovator, a leader, and really an icon in the care of contemporary art, including installations, time-based and electronic media, and performance. She has 30 years of experience in the conservation of contemporary art, establishing and leading the pioneering time-based media conservation section at Tate from 1996 until 2010, when she became head of collection care research at Tate, in which role she has developed, led, and supported research related to the conservation and management of Tate's collections. And since 2016, she's also held a special chair at Maastricht University as professor of art collection and care. So that's just really a brief introduction. Um, and Pip, I'd like to thank you so much for agreeing to answer our two questions. And here they are. Can performance be conserved? If so, how? If not, why not? And what does it mean to conserve performance? Thank you, Jules, for that lovely introduction. And it's going to be so interesting to hear all the different perspectives coming through your project. And thank you so much uh, for inviting me to participate in your wonderful project and posing your two questions. So as you said in your introduction, I come at this uh, having recently moved from uh, the Contemporary Art Museum to academia. And so I'll answer these questions really based on my experience of working with performance within the Contemporary Art Museum, which is where we really are thinking about how to continue to be able to activate and display these works, how to bring them to our public and how to kind of represent these forms of practice within the gallery and the stories that we tell to the public about art. So, uh, Tate has a long tradition of engagement with um, performance, but only started to acquire live work in 2005. But before that, and continuing, we also represent performance through photography, through video, through film, uh, and through objects, which might be seen as performance remains. Um, but this long tradition actually goes back, uh, I think the first documented performance was in 1968 by the French sculptor César, who had this form of practice he called expansions. They were sort of happenings. And here he would take a, a fast drying, uh, expanding polyurethane foam and create these kind of extraordinary cloud-like shapes um, using this polyurethane foam live. And so this event, this happening, this expansion took place um, in March uh, 1968 in front of Tate, what's now called Tate Britain, but then was the only gallery we had. So it was just known as Tate. And then after the, the foam had expanded and done its thing, the public were invited to come and cut off a, a section and then have it signed by the artist. So this is our first documented um, performance event. And interestingly, it also was protested. So the British artists, Peter Sedgley and um, Stuart Brisley were at the event and they objected to the kind of um, scheduling uh, of what should have been sort of more spontaneous happenings in their view, and also really protesting the idea that this form of practice could be absorbed into the museum. So what they did was they took these sections of polyurethane that you could kind of cut off and take, and they put them on the railings in front of Tate Britain. Um, a woman was passing who had matches, um, and so Stuart Brisley actually set fire to these um, remains of the performance and they were very, very flammable. <laughs> so it caused a bit of a hoo-ha, questions were asked to the trustees, um, et cetera. So not, I guess in our first, uh, this first documented live event at Tate Britain, we have all of those kind of questions around performance um, 
raised in really interesting ways. But going back to your question, I guess, um, yes, uh, we, we can conserve performance and, and have been doing so since 2005, continue to engage in research and have that translate into practice in the amazing work that Louise Lawson and the time-based media conservation team at Tate uh, are doing to continually uh, kind of think and uh, around the conservation of, of different forms of performance. Um, I think there's a really interesting question about why we would think we couldn't conserve performance. And I think Rebecca Schneider's uh, research in her book, Performing Remains, has been really interesting and important here because it points to the fact that this focus on ephemerality and loss and the kind of the moment um, and the presence of that being present at that particular moment of the performance very much comes out of the Peggy Phelan tradition at NYU um, and that kind of focus that if you know that that if that moment is lost everything is lost whereas in fact I think that the different strategies around the conservation of performance are varied. And, um, and I think that part of the idea that you can't conserve performance probably comes also from this myth about the conserved museum object being a static thing that by the museum magic, we can preserve identically, you know, untouched for eternity. And I think once we start to kind of debunk that myth in a way um, we actually have some very dynamic interesting stories about the lives of artworks which I think are very engaging and uh, and interesting so performance helps us to I think debunk some of these not very helpful myths about conservation and the museum that's <laughs> what I would say so that is sort of um also kind of takes me to, I guess, the fact that I think that there are these different very creative approaches and the importance of this interdisciplinary thinking around the conservation of performance. And um, I was really lucky to lead a project in 2012, 2013 with Vivian Van Saas from uh, the University of Maastricht. And there we had a AHRC networking grant, which allowed us to really reflect on that seven years at that point of collecting live work and its conservation, and to really bring in these interdisciplinary voices. So uh, we looked at the conservation of performance through the lens of uh, traditions of transmission or conservation that came through dance and theatre and also activism. And that was a, a really kind of rich moment, I think, in really appreciating the really different traditions of, uh, of the conservation of performance and, and performance legacy. So that kind of takes me to your next question about what does it look like to conserve performance? And um, some performances are very simple instruction works. Um, Claire Bishop has coined the term delegated performance, but you know, some of these works are very, very simple. Uh, they're easy to lo loan. They don't take up a lot of space in your storage. They've got really low carbon footprint. So they are very simple works to include within the museum, but others are much, much more complex. And um, we've been really lucky, I think, through um, the current project, Reshaping the Collectible When Artworks Live in the Museum, which has allowed us to really think about the skills and knowledge that is needed to continue to activate some of these works. And so we've been thinking about this through different performance works, but one of which uh, is Tony Conrad's 10 Years Alive on the Infinite Plain, which was first performed in 1972 at the Kitchen in New York and is an experimental sound and film piece. And what's extraordinary about this work is over its history, it's had this great uh, community that have really supported its performance, uh, both whilst Conrad was alive, but also um, after his death. And so when the museum got involved, it was very 
clear that we were one node within this broader ecosystem that had been so essential to the survival of the work, but also would be so essential to the activation of the work in the future. And I think that performance has really helped us recognize the museum as part of that broader ecosystem. Um, and I think that there are other works that really do also kind of point to what kind of capital in a way the museum needs to have in order to continue to activate these works. So whether it's an experimental music tradition of musicians and composers and musical instrument makers that are so important to Tony Conrad's 10 Years Alive and the Infinite Plane or Tarek Atui's The Reverse Collection, which is another work um, that we have in the collection, or Tanya Bruguera's Tatlin's Whispers Number no. 5, which involves the museum having to hire genuine mounted policemen to uh, carry out crowd control techniques that are used in moments of civil unrest and, and often kind of sporting crowd control around sporting events as well. Um, so it kind of makes us think of this whole range of dependencies that the museum has outside the museum in terms of the skills and knowledge that we need in order to conserve these works, which I think is interesting. Another kind of thing that's been really interesting in the Reshaping the Collectible project has been to look at artworks that generate archives. And uh, so here very much uh, benefiting from the work of uh, the archivist Sarah Haylett. Um, and so we have a number of works in the collection. Uh, Tanya Bruguera's Tatlin's Whispers number five is one example of a work that uh, generates an archive. Pavel Althammer's work, uh, film, and also um, a work that we've been looking at recently is Richard Bell's Embassy, which might be worth kind of reflecting on for a moment. So um, Richard Bell's Embassy is, homage, is really a homage to a site of protest for Aboriginal land rights um, that was constructed outside the government buildings in Canberra in 1972. And it was originally uh, just an umbrella and then it became um, a, a more kind of military style tent. And this idea of creating an embassy for the Arib uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people within their own country to protest their rights within the space of a tent as a sovereign space. So Richard Bell has taken this idea and uh, into this work called Embassy, which um, has recently um, been acquired into the collections. It's co-owned between the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney and Tate in London, again, reinscribing that sort of colonial geography um, around this issue of land, um, this colonial history of, of, of uh, land and Australia. Um, so the work is now reactivated around the world. Um, currently, it's uh, in Kassel in Germany, uh, at Documenta. And the communities who um, activate the tent through discussions to do with racial, social justice and often land, um, the idea is to create an archive of these activations in fact an archive exists but to think about how we can learn from community archive practice and activist practice to um, make an archive where the communities who are contributing to it have control over how it's catalogued um, and issues of access so really interesting to kind of draw in the learning from outside the kind of museum space um, in that project. So I guess what we've seen is over 17 years now of acquiring life work um, is that all these works are so different. So how we conserve performance is going to be really different depending on these different works. But I think also these ideas from outside you know, these different disciplines have really helped us think about performance. And one of the things that um, actually I 
I found really helpful about Rebecca Schneider's uh, book, Performing Remains, was um, helping us to kind of challenge this hierarchy of the live over other ways in which performance exists and persists. And a really interesting example in Tate's collection is a work by Gustav Metzger called The Recreation of the First Public Performance of Autodestructive Art. And uh, this is a work that was originally a lecture demonstration from 1960. And when it was first performed, Metzger was really, really careful to ensure that um, there were no material remains of that piece because he really didn't want elements to be commodified. But then later in 2004, first for an exhibition, and then for Tate's collection in 2015, carefully reconstructed um, a sort of sculpture um, referencing this, this performance um, lecture demonstration, working from photographs of the original event so that it also exists in this sculptural form in the galleries. And I, I find that really, really interesting. And I think, you know, one of the things that we constantly learn from for our practice is really from art and artists. And I think performance has really helped us and the artists that we're working with to think about the conservation of works. Um, when, you know, as Robert Morris famously <laughs> said, um, the object uh, becomes less self-important, I think is what he said. You know, so I think it's really informing other forms of, of conservation as well. And when I was building, uh, a con trying to build a conceptual framework for thinking about the conservation of time-based media works, you know, it was actually the philosophy of music, so a kind of performance <laughs> art form uh, that I turned to, um, particularly the work of Stephen Davies and Lydia Goa, to help me think about other ways that we would um, uh, think about the, the reactivation of things over time, the transmission of things over time and ideas of authenticity. So performance has always been really present and, and important um, to my thinking in that sense. And there's definitely been watershed moments. I mean, I think if I think back to when, you know, we began to acquire live work, so 2005 and the acquisition of Tina Chagall's This Is Propaganda. So this is a work that famously, um, uh, part of the custodianship of this work requires that we don't use our normal forms of documentation. So the work is not documented. We don't create a record for it. We don't, we don't photograph it. We don't video it. All the things that we would normally do uh, in order to kind of document a performance so that we would know how to uh, reactivate it in the future. And um, that, that is not uh, part of the custodianship of this work. Um, instead, the artist is, has um, asked us to remember the work. And so different forms of kind of um, uh, practice have to come to the fore. So ideas from dance, like body to body transmission, and really just thinking about what it means to remember a work. Um, and that very subjective experience of learning the work um, and remembering it. And at the same time as I was working on that Tino Chagall work, I was uh, working on an installation of Bruce Nauman's Mapping the Studio to Flip Flop, Flip Flop, Fat Chance, John Cage. And, you know, working with um, Bruce Nauman and, and uh, his assistant to kind of learn the work. And I think because this experience of working with Tino Chagall had been so um kind of focused on this idea of learning it it made me really aware that that's also what I was doing in relation to the Nauman piece and this this moment in the museum which is often described as you know the artist will be present for the first installation of the work is actually this very concrete moment of 
learning the work and being taught what it means to care for it and what to pay attention to. And I think that the experience of working with a performance um, at that time really brought that to the fore for me in a kind of, in a, yeah, in an interesting way. Um, and I think the other thing, um, you know, that that whole interdisciplinary um, perspective has been really important. And in reshaping the collectible, I've so appreciated not only what the academic scholars have brought to the project, but also our embedded researchers. So Elia Markel has brought, you know, traditions of, of memory studies and thinking about memory ecologies to our work with Conrad. Sarah Haylett has brought these um, practices from community archives and activist archives to the thinking of the project. Uh, Stephen Hyten has brought this kind of the pragmatics of being a museum registrar in this space. And Lucy Bailey has, has brought not only this kind of uh, finely tuned sense of, you know, historical research, art historical research, but also a real interest in unlearning and what that means in the context of, of the work of the museum and, and our project at this time. Um, and I think we've kind of where I would say we've got to now is not only recognizing the, the scope of performance, performance being this sort of vast area of different forms of, of practice, but also recognizing that artworks can take on different forms at different points in their lives and that performance artworks, you know, can take on these different forms um, at various moments. And that actually is quite an expansive way of thinking about conservation um, and has helped us think about other forms uh, such as digital art in really productive ways, actually. Um, so yeah, so just to, I guess, finish up what I wanted to say, I think um, performance is interesting because it is ephemeral in one sense, but also incredibly persistent. Um, and it does open up these expanded ideas of conservation and that idea that, you know, going back to that idea of artworks having lives and being able to take on different forms at different points um, uh, in their histories has actually really helped inform us, our thinking around a whole range uh, of types of objects and their conservation. So thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I think that's a wonderful note to end on, performances. Limits, but also the, the possibilities um, that, that, that performance gives us for thinking about conservation.